Welcome to the Shoot Hunt Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Avery. Ryan Avery. And my color commentator today is Jake Ruscheney. <laughs> Are you ready? I've been ready since 9 a.m., sir. How fat is your ass today? I knew that was coming, and, I, and I, I'm embarrassed. You know, because you, you never want to say it can never happen. I mean, you know, the chances of getting violently murdered by a bunny are low, <laughs> but, but yeah. never zero. <laughs> We're bringing up some straight bullshit. <laughs> Dude, if it ain't hunting clothes, my wife buys it for me. But your, your wife bought that color for you? I just said, give me some Crocs. She's just way too comfortable with your gayness then. Gosh, I got a really long tongue. <laughs> Good. Uh, we're back and we have form again because if you've listened to the previous podcast on dropping scopes, um, he has a lot to say. So this time around, we're talking <laughs> hunting bullets. Form, welcome back to bullets, the show. Bullets used in hunting. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we we're going around and around because we talked about match bullets. We're going to talk about premium hunting bullets. We're going to talk about mono bullets. Well, we're just going to have bullets for hunting, like Jake said. Where do you want to start with this form? Uh, so I would say we'll probably keep it to like a 50,000 foot view, right? In other words, we <laughs> broad overview of things that people can go learn on their own. And I guess if, if we wanted to get more into it, just a, a legitimate full on discussion of terminal ballistics is probably two hours in and of itself. Right. Yeah, we like, don't let's do that's, it. that's the thing. Let's right? do it. Let's do it. Here, here's where I want to start. It's, where does it come? Where does it start? Where where you cannot use match bullets for hunting? Ignorance. Okay. That's, well, I mean that's that's one hundred percent. End of podcast. We're done. Well, oh, how about how about the fucking <laughs> the fact that it's called a match? Yeah. Bullet. Again, yeah. going back to marketing and the general yep. hunter. When you when when Hornady markets two bullets and calls them ELDX and ELDM in their amazing marketing abilities. The, so here's, the here's a great believe. question. What's the difference in terminal ballistics wound channel size between a 140 ELDM 65 and a 143 ELDX? Don't Nothing. know. You can't tell the difference. It cannot exactly. be measured. Exactly. Right. But so that's not how it's marketed. Correct. To yeah. 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 So, okay. So what I would first say is for people to understand, unlike the scopes, this is a known thing, right? So it's a little bit of history of terminal ballistics. That's what we're talking about. Because without this, it just seems like another opinion, right? Just like, I'm not talking all like I think I feel, right? It's like, let's go prove this. So bullets, there's no magic to bullets, right? Like, if you want to know what a bullet does in tissue, you need to shoot it in tissue or properly calibrated tissue simulant and measure the wound. Bullets are, in general, how deep they penetrate, how wide the wound is. That's it. 3D view of a bullet track in an animal. You can pretty much just stop right there. Shoot it in tissue simulant, measure the wound, go shoot animals. So, and that is largely, there is some correlation as you go up in caliber size and bullet, blah, blah, blah. The potential to get larger wounds is true. Potential. You very quickly run out of, I don't want the larger anymore. I'm going to eat this thing that I'm trying to shoot, right? So that there's this is ceiling there. It's a little bit different for every person. So lots of things like in shooting is based on grandpappy told me, gun store myths, it feels good. And that doesn't mean anything. My grandfather told me a lot of stuff that is empirically incorrect, but it's the best he could do within his time frame. That doesn't mean he's an idiot. He was a genius, right? It just means he didn't understand what he was talking about in this subject. Just because grandpappy shot loopholes don't mean that he was an idiot because they don't hold zero grade. Dude, there was a time when that was the best thing you could get. It could be again. Maybe next year it will be. So when we look at like foot pounds of energy, right? So we're going to talk about that is a meaningless term. And what I mean by that is. It requires energy to do work, right? The, I'm not an engineer here, but it requires X amount of energy to do X amount of work on any kind of bullet. It's that the number tells me nothing. So there are bullets in the exact same caliber that have 3,000 foot-pounds of energy that do less wounding than a field point arrow, arrow with a field point, and that same caliber 
at the same weight of bullet, but where the energy is in the sub 500s that you can stick a basketball through. That is a meaningless number. It doesn't tell me anything about what that bullet's going to do in tissue. That's going to hurt a lot of people's feelings. Yeah, and as we go, I'm going to explain why. And guess what? This one has nice references to really good medical literature. Mm. Okay, so up until basically the late 80s, you could think of terminal ballistics was, the, regardless of what your belief system is, think of it as like the space that has no big bang yet there's nothing but darkness right it was just little little light energy pop up and go out this was terminal ballistics all the way till just after vietnam basically for the most part there's there was some in there but really like a little candle got lit after vietnam with martin fackler so he was an army surgeon then he went to the army ballistics lab whatever like ballistics testing that's where they started like trying to measure wounds Right. And with the idea that foot pounds of energy and all these things, it wasn't, it wasn't shown to be right. Right. Like this idea that like, if this bullet hits you in your toe, it blows your leg off. Like that just, that's not <laughs> real. So it started with him and you can Google Martin Fackler, Martin L. Fackler, terminal ballistics. He's got great pa papers out there. Um, think of terminal ballistics and killing as like this, like I'm looking at your picture, on the wall here, a lot of the West has dead standing timber that is just, a, it's a fire waiting to start, right? That was the hunting, that was the bullet world as it relates to killing things. All the timber was dead, it was ready for the spark. The FBI Miami shootout in like 88, 86, 87, whatever it was, late 80s, was the, the spark that lit the whole world on fire for terminal ballistics. So regardless of what we like, whether people like the FBI or feds, it doesn't matter. The reality is, is the FBI has the best and most complete terminal ballistics laboratory in the world. They're the only closed loop in the world. They, they talk about this publicly. So they test bullets. They test the guns. They shoot people. They get those bullets back. They get all the results back, and they compare them to the test. Okay, enough on that. What they did is after they had this shootout, their gun, their bullets didn't work like it should. And they started saying why the bullet had velocity. It had energy was a big one. That bullet should have worked, but it didn't. It stopped just short, sh short, excuse me, short of the person they needed to stop's heart. So they brought in the best trauma surgeon in the world, the best ones from the biggest ER, you know, emergency rooms in the country, uh, ballistics labs, army, like all of these people that should know this hunters. They got him in a big symposium and say, what do bullets actually do in tissue? We got to measure this. That's where it all mixed in. Martin Fackler, FBI, uh, Buford Boone with the FBI, like all these guys, uh, McPherson. And they came up with that bullets have to do something and you have to measure it. You can't just, it has to be measured. I want to know what a bullet does in tissue. I need to shoot it in tissue. The problem is, is tissue is variable, right? Like no two shots on an animal or a person in this case Bone are ever the same. That's correct. That shit, yeah. So what they came out with is that first they just wanted a consistent median that they can compare bullet to bullet to bullet, right? So the, the end result, you can Google all these names I just thrown out there and read on it, was 10% ballistic organic gelatin. So not, not clear ballistics gel, it doesn't work. 10% ballistics organic gelatin. And the simplified version is if you take a mammal and you melt them into liquid, everything, every component in their body, melt them into liquid and put it in a block. That's 10% ballistics organic gelatin. It's an average density. And when I say calibrated, it has to be shot with a BB. That BB has to be between certain feet per second. Muzzle velocity, impact velocity has to penetrate X depth. That makes sure the... I think it's sheer strength, but it's the, the density of the gel is correct. And then we just compare bullets to bullets to bullets. And what they figured out is like, hey, you need 12, this is again, 200 pound mammal, relatively thin. To go through everything they've got, you shoot through ply, you shoot bear gel, gel with clothing over it, plywood, two pieces of sheet metal, glass, wallboard, like all these barriers. And they want 12 to 18 inches of penetration, 12 inch minimum, and reliable and consistent upset, right? Like that's what they started. And it's it's 
You have to understand where this started to understand why it works for, for animals, right? It was never intended like if this bullet penetrates 15 inches in gel, it'll penetrate 15 inches in tissue. However, we just came out of a quote unquote longest war in American history where there's a lot of studies done on this. All this is open source. You can, people can Google the joint international wound ballistics. You can just Google that and you'll pop up stuff. You can Google uh, Gary K. Martin, like Dr. Gary K. Martin, all these guys. It's not a one for one. You can't 100% say that a bullet goes 16 inches in ballistics gel, that it's going to go 16 inches in an elk. However, trends are seen and what, what can now be stated, at least with certain animals, if you will, is that what you see done in properly calibrated gel is what you're going to get, right? So like I can tell you in whitetail deer, if you take and you look at what a bullet does through 10% ballistics gel and bear gel, and you just hit ribs like a Southern or Texas whitetail deer, that's what that bullet's going to do. Right. And there's some, there's some nuances there and you can use three quarter plywood over it. And that's like a sh quote unquote shoulder or all that. Right. Just understand that it used to be, we have to shoot a bunch of animals and then try to interpret that data that we got from the animals with people that don't really know what they're looking at, looking at as far as wounds and they're misrepresenting or misunderstanding the results they see and how many people can shoot. Like, it's not just. If I shoot 15 animals with one bullet, that's not data. Like data, like we're going to talk about shot group sizes. It starts at like 30-ish is where you start getting that normalization and like a 95 percent solution. 30-ish, the more the better. So how do you get somebody that shot 30 animals in exactly the same spot at 3,000 feet per second impact? And then 30 animals at 2,800 feet per second impact. And then 30 – like you can't, right? You can't. But that's how it used to be. Shoot animals, see what happens. Now, with properly done ballistics gel, so like for the listeners, every bullet that you like that's on the market right now, if it's come out in the last 20 years, it was designed and engineered in 10% ballistics gelatin. Every one of them. Even if the companies don't talk about it. Like I don't know of any mainstream bullet that wasn't. And if it wasn't, it probably sucks, to be clear. Right? You love Barnes X, guess what? TSXs, TTSXs, LRXs were all shot into ballistics gel. We prove them and test them in ballistics gel. I say we, the, the community does. Mm -hmm. Then they go and they validate those tests on animals generally. How about that? How about that gel that we shot recently, you and I, that looked like it had been shot about 5,000 times? Where at? You were with me. I was trying not to say who it was. You and oh I shit! Yeah, 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 yeah. Look like look big. like look like uh, a decade old. Yeah. Pile like of how gel many times can you shoot into gel before you have to fix that it? That they're developing bullets in. So were we talking like clear ballistics gel here? It wasn't clear. It wasn't clear anymore. It was like it was like brownish, <clears throat> opaqueish. Well, so that you can see that's the problem. You can get that with clear ballistics gel, like uh -huh. the brand. So it's synthetic gel, which is not the same. It's not consistent, like. The places that need bullets to be consistent, like genuinely need them can be consistent. Organic ballistic gel is a pain in the butt to deal with. It is not fun. It is, it's a time so it's waster. It's refrigerated. It has to be mixed correctly. It has to be refrigerated. You've got to test it. You've got to keep it cold. It's got to maintain its same temperature. When you shoot it, it has to be in the same temperature. Like, it's fast. The, the places that do this have like refrigerated vans. They take it out and they have to shoot it immediately. If they're shooting at 100 yards, it ain't like it sits out there for 10 minutes and they get to shoot it because it's already starting to melt if it's, you know, above a certain temperature, right? So nobody would want – those places would love something stable like synthetic representation, well, it but it just doesn't work. It was a fucking 100 degrees in there, so that must not have been it. Yeah, no, no, no. They'll, they'll, it's organic. I mean, it starts coming apart pretty quick, right? So done correctly, it's phenomenal. Done incorrectly, it's a waste of time. Um, there is zero correlation to any synthetic thing on the market to living tissue. There's zero. Some, there's some clear ballistics gel that they say you can like shoot it and reform it and all that. 
so good stuff. so here's the issue. So one, because what is what are we like? What is ballistics gel used for? It's used as a representation. So co- comparing bullet to bullet to bullet over time, right? So I can compare a bullet today to bullets ten years ago, mm-hmm. right? And because it's consistent. Uh, like Vice, like I think it's Vice or Vicey or whatever, ever how you say it, they make a lot of the stuff that's used, the organic stuff. It comes in powder. You mix it with water, blah, blah, blah. Um, so lot to lot of the synthetic stuff changes. So the exact same bullet and the exact same gun, same impact velocity, just lot to lot, like purchased years apart and shot, like the performance is different. You'll get 15 inches of penetration in clear ballistics gel. You might get five in tissue or I'm I'm making stuff up now, but that's like kind of the, you might get 10 in tissue or you might get 15 in the clear ballistics gel and get 20 inches in tissue. Like it, it has no correlation. Clear ballistics gel, the best purpose is to kind of show people because it's cheaper and can be reused. It's not consistent, right? That's the thing. But you can show visually what is happening easier in gel to people. Like in the animal, you can see the temporary stretch cavity and all these terms we'll talk about. It's good for a visual representation, but you can't measure anything off of it. I mean, it is very clear in testing that it doesn't work, right? Like regardless of how we think about it, when the FBI switches to clear ballistics gel, then you're probably solid. Or anything, I don't mean that as the brain. I just mean when they move away from 10% ballistics ordinance gelatin, Just go to it. They're doing it correctly. And yes, it's 10%, not 20%. Changes the outcome. Like 20% ballistics gel does not replicate what that bullet will do in tissue in any way. There's no correlation whatsoever. When I, when I watch those, there's, there's lots of people shooting Mm -hmm. ballistic gel now. And what even, what exactly am I looking for? Cause it all looks relatively the same. It does this expansion thing yep. in the slow mo, then yeah, it comes it back in, in, and then there's some type of flash point that happens. You'll see it with some, yep, a, yep, mm-hmm. and and then it jumps off the bench, and then then yep. they start digging the fragments yep. out to show you what. The sometimes they is. fly out the side, sometimes yep. they fly yep. out the top. So think of it. So bullets. Let me think how to say it. Bullets killed by destroying tissue, right? The more tissue destroyed, all things being equal, the faster something dies. There's a point with every animal, every single specific animal and every size of animal where more tissue damage unless it affects the central nervous system, so the spine or the brain, does not result in faster death, right? So in other words, between a RPG hitting a deer and a field-tipped arrow hitting a deer, somewhere in there, you hit a point where it doesn't kill any better, right? Like, so we just understand that. So it's 3D, right? So... The first thing when you're talking about real ballistics testing, right? And they're, so they're using like phantom cameras. They're using these really high speed cameras and they're measuring it. And they're measuring at certain impact velocity. Nobody looks at or cares what foot pounds of energy is produced or momentum or anything else because it can have 5,000 foot pounds of energy and create the tiniest wound channel you've ever seen. It can have almost no min- no momentum on the scale and create phenomenal wounds, right? You have to measure the wound. That's what creates the damage. So you look at total penetration depth, right? So that's expressed in inches, okay? Then you, there's penetration, temporary stretch cavity. So I'll explain what all these are when we're done. Penetration, temporary stretch cavity, max temporary stretch cavity, uh, temporary stretch cavity length TCL, neck length, Okay, so penetration is pretty simple. That is how deep that bullet went. Okay, so that's when we're talking about killing, number one is hit the target. Okay, great. Let's get that out of the way. Got to hit the target. Mm -hmm. Okay, the number two thing is it has to reach vital organs. Now, that's where everybody gets hung up on bullets and they're like, well, this bullet penetrates more and blah, 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 blah. So a couple of truths is the amount of energy has no relation, tells you nothing of what that bullet's going to do in tissue. And what that bullet looks like when you pull it out has nothing to do with how well it killed, except it's almost universally in, it's almost proportional in a negative way. I said that incorrectly. The worse that bullet looks, the uglier it looks, probably the better wound it created. Because pretty little bullets stay together and they create narrow wounds. And we'll explain why. So you're talking about pretty mushrooms. Yes. If you pull it out and you're like, oh, that looks like an ad. 
And then you shoot another, you pull another bullet out and you're like, dude, that thing is like broken and looks angry. It's jagged. Which one would you rather get hit with? Just look at it. Right? Like if, and we'll explain why this is all measurable. This isn't like, I like, I think I feel here. So maximum penetration is how, how far the bullet penetrated. Then we kind of back up and we go neck length. And what that is, is from the point that the bullet enters the tissue or the tissue simulant. I'm just, everything applies to animals. I'm just going to talk about gel because it can be measured from shot, shot, shot. That is the bullet penetrated X distance before it started upsetting. And the correct term is upset. It's not expansion or anything else. And the reason why is because bullets don't always expand. That is that idea that from the front, it starts opening and expanding outwards into this mushroom. But it's not. Like a bullet that expands does, does damage because it's frontal diameter, right? It's creating a, a wider wound channel. But so does a bullet that fragments or a bullet that tumbles, right? So it's upset. I want to know where the point from it enters, the, touches the target to when it starts creating more damage than bullet diameter, if you will, yeah. right? So burgers, right? BLDs, they typically go in four to six inches before they start upsetting wild. But you can see that in gel and you see that in animals. Barnes TTSX, LRX, at high enough impact velocity, it has almost zero neck length usually less than half inch, hmm. right? So really? it, it, within a half inch of that first gel, it's starting to open up, hmm. okay? The different bullets all behave differently. So we know neck length, we know how deep it is. Well, now the middle ground is how wide is the temporary stretch cavity? So in wounding, you have the permanent crush cavity and a temporary stretch. Those are the two primary things you measure if you're looking at 3D, right? So. There's a couple analogies to use. Permanent crush cavity is what, what the bullet physically touches. So if I'm shoving a half inch rod through an animal, it's a half inch permanent crush cavity. That changes based on velocity and fragmentation, but that's the best way to, to think of it, right? What it, if I throw a rock into calm water, right? The water that the rock physically touches as it goes is the permanent crush cavity, hmm. okay? If I throw the ripples that come off that rock is the temporary stretch cavity. So the tissue stretches and radiates outward from the passage of the bullet due to velocity and stretches outward. Now, tissue is elastic. Most of the tissue in the body is elastic. It's, you know, other than your brain, spleen, liver to an extent, spinal cord, everything is like a brick of rubber band. You stretch it, it pops right back. Okay, so... When you see gel, you have to be careful because gel shows a temporary stretch cavity and makes it look like the entire temporary stretch cavity is a part of the permanent crush cavity. So there's some nuance of learning to read the gel in the slow motion and see what happens, right? So there's, you can't just look and when you see this massive, like it balloons out and go, look at that, it's 14 inches. No, nah, dog, that ain't how it works, right? So it's, there is a thing about measuring it, but you have that permanent crush cavity the bullet physically touches or parts of the bullet physically touch. So fragmentation becomes part of the permanent crush cavity. And then you have the temporary stretch cavity. So that's the tissue that's radiating outward from the passage of the bullet, right? Due to velocity. So somewhere around 2000 feet per second, it depends on caliber, the wider the bullet is in the frontal diameter, the lower the velocity this happens, the smaller the bullet diameter, the higher velocity. But so, excuse me, somewhere around 2,000 feet per second, 2,200 feet per second, a bullet, the tissue is, is expanding outward. It's being flung outward from the passage of the bullet, stretching so much that it tears. So it's like a rubber band. You can take a rubber band and go right to the limit of like, dude, it's about to pop. And then let it back up and it won't pop, right? And let's say that that limit on this rubber band is 12 inches. It's like right there. And if I stretch it slowly to 12 inches and my fingers have to stop at 12 inches, the rubber band doesn't pop. But if I stretch it as fast as I can for that 12 inches and they still stop at 12 inches, the rubber band pops because of the elasticity. You've, you've exceeded the elasticity of that item. So the rubber band in this case or tissue. So when you shoot a bullet hits at sufficient velocity, 
the temporary stretch cavity is fast enough that it's like the, the tissue is radiating outward and stretching so fast that it's tearing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the way to think of that is like the water that the rock physically touches is the permanent crush cavity. The, the depth of water till the bottom is the, is the total penetration depth. The temporary stretch cavity is the ripples that come off that. And if you wanted to kind of like throw an idea about it, the splash that happens upwards and out is like your, your, your tearing. tissue tearing from the temporary stretch cavity, if that makes sense, right? As soon as we understand that, now we can start looking at what actually matters in a bullet and measuring it instead of just a guessing at it, right? Because it takes all the novelty away. I think there's a, one, there's ignorance. There's also a lot of people like to make things harder than they are because it makes them sound smart maybe, or I don't know what the, it, there's a lot of it out there. There's no secrets with bullets. Like there's none. You can measure this. You can see it. Dude, well, as soon as we remove the novelty from killing with bullets, it all starts to make sense. Specifically why the three of us shoot the bullets we typically do. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now take that information. We've created this through gel or whatever, this 3D image of a bullet. Okay, so what should a bullet do? Well, I don't know. What do you want a bullet to do? Destroy. So, the, well, that, that's the thing, right? The more tissue destruction, the faster things die. Shoot a bigger gun. Not so much, right? And here's the reason why. So you need a minimum penetration depth. Well, how much? And it all depends on like... Well, you said you had hit vitals, so whatever the animal is from the point of impact, where yeah. the vitals are. So one of the neat things that to understand is it is entirely possible, and this happens, to shoot a coyote with a bullet, broadside, and that bullet get caught on the skin on the exit side, and you go, there's no way I'd shoot a deer with that bullet. It only penetrated like six inches and stopped. So depending on the animal, the exit side skin, because it is so stretchy and the bullet has slowed through the animal, can equal inches of muscle tissue. So you can have a bullet that stopped in that coyote's hide that would go straight through an elk scapula, straight through an elk shoulder, the dreaded elk shoulders. So you have to like pay attention to what you're doing, right? So like the first thing is a bullet that doesn't exit on like a broadside shot doesn't mean you can't take a quartering shot. Like the skin on an elk can be inches of more penetration, multiples upon multiple. It's not like, oh, it's 14 inches wide, an elk is, and it got caught, so it only penetrate 14 inches. No, you shoot that at any other angle, that thing might go 30 inches. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's first, well, right? Because the hide, basically the hide stretched Oh yeah, it's, like a it's a trampoline. Yes. That's what it is. I mean, it's a trampoline or a net. Keep going. I'll ask a question a minute. No, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just being <laughs> the devil's advocate. Okay, go ahead. So, with that term, with that crush cavity. Yep. Cr so people argue you're shooting 147 grain ELDM. Yep. Or you're shooting a, let's just say 180 grain uh, Barnes X bullet. Yep. LRX, whatever. That there's more tissue being crushed when that X bullet opens than in the 147 fragmenting. Not even remotely close. Can you explain that? Okay, so this is where it gets a little icky, right? Where there's no, people want really simple answers. Um, and this is a simple answer. It's just not, those things can be really simple, but not easy to understand if that makes sense, right? And I don't mean this in any way bad. Okay, so let's look at a wound that is created when we shoot and we'll now we'll switch it to like animals. So I shoot 180 grain Barnes TTSX out of a 30 cal above 26, 2700 feet per second impact. That bullet is going to expand to about a half inch diameter, right? One of the, no, we're not going to talk low velocity impacts on this because there's a whole misconception of, I pulled the bullet out at the end of the elk. It shot it lengthways and look at the perfect expansion. Yeah. That's as big as it ever got through three and a half feet of elk. Right, so we'll ignore that for a second. So th there is tissue when that bullet hits at 2,800 feet per second that is being torn in the temporary stretch cavity, right? But because that bullet's not fragmenting, it's just the velocity of the tissue radiating outward, the temporary stretch that's causing a tear, right? So 
Imagine we took our rubber band and we stretched it and it got some fissures in it, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's take a rubber band, stretch it to the limit and touch it with a scalpel. Mm -hmm. So every when that bullet penetrates, like we can measure that. So that bullet's gonna create a permanent crush cavity that's about two inches in diameter at high muzzle velocity. That means the actual physical the tissue, the T T T S X L R X. Okay. Any of the okay. the monos that stay together. Okay. Its wound channel is basically like take two fingers, if that, and shove it through the animal. Okay. It's a half inch rod, a one inch rod, right? And you're gonna get some bruising out there, but if you miss something by two, if you miss a, the heart by two inches or the Barnes TTSX, any mono like that, you've missed the heart. Like you're not, sometimes you can get some temporary stretch tearing and stuff in the heart, but it isn't, you can't count on it. Now, so you've got a, a wound with that bullet, even regardless that it's much bigger and much faster and has much more energy. What you've done is reduce the total damage that that cartridge caliber can do. You've choked it down to get something else. In the case of like monos, that's deeper penetration and it looks pretty, right? Little See, flower. That's right. Because you got to go back to wh why <laughs> they, they exist. That word like weight retention also. That's right, yeah. right? And so, again, I don't... If I only care about how well it kills, then what it looked like and how much it weighs at the end doesn't mean anything to me. I only care how it kills, right? So you've got a wound that's, uh, uh, be generous, inch and a half in diameter rod shoved through an animal. That's your, your 180 grain TTSX, LRX, whatever, mono, something like that, hitting at high muzzle velocity, 2,800 feet per second. You do the same with a 6.5 and a 140.70 LDM, it's six to eight inches wide. That it means from the center of the the center of the bullet passing, it goes sixteen to eighteen inches minimum of penetration. The Barnes X will probably do twenty generally. And that Barnes X is a twenty inch, twenty five inch rod max. Um, if it hits skin, like on the exit side, that's one and a half inches in diameter. That ELDM in the six five is five to six inch wide football. It's a football that has a tail that's 16 inches. So you now put that volume inside of an animal. I can miss the heart. This is where the bigger guns give you more margin for error. No, it's better bullets give you more margin for error, right? I can miss the heart by three inches or two inches with a 6.5 and fragments and the tearing, crushing, and all that tissue damage that's happening due to that bullet is affecting the heart, right? That is primarily driven by bullet design, not bullet caliber. So is there a difference now? The answer would be like, well, what happens if you shoot a 30 cal 225 ELDX or ELDM, excuse me, in comparison to the 65147? Yeah, it's bigger. It's, it's a, instead of a six inch circle of damage created by the, the 65, it's a seven inch circle. Like the volume due to that one extra inch is quite a bit. But the actual point that you can miss is a half inch in any direction. Congratulations. Unless you do something silly. I mean, there's our bullets that can really do tissue damage. Be so far beyond what anybody wants in an animal, it's not funny. So, like, in general, to get deeper penetration, your wound is going to be narrower and quite a bit. To get a wider wound... For any given cartridge caliber, any given caliber, your penetration is going to be slightly shallower. However, that is variable as well because what primarily inhibits penetration is frontal diameter, right? So how wide the bullet is. So I can have, okay, we got a 180 grain 30 cal bullet. It loses 50% of its weight. And they'd be like, it's not going to penetrate as far as a bullet that maintained 100% of its weight. Well, if that 30 cal, the what's left of the 30 cal, because it fragmented is 30 caliber, it's 0 0.308 or 0.4 in diameter. Yes, it weighs less. It also has way less surface area to stop it. Like it doesn't take as much force to put a knitting needle through something as it does a Coke can, right? Mm -hmm. And then that you take the other bullet, maintain 100%, but it expands, let's say it's awesome and it expands to 0 0.5 or 0 0.6. Well, the surface area that it's got to push through the tissue to keep going is way more 
than one that's that's much narrower, right? So you, it's very common that like you look at like a bar, um, a Nosler Acubon. I've caught way more. Our whole group has caught way more Acubons and TSXs, TTSXs, in animals than we ever have match bullets. It's the reason being is because the frontal diameter of a bullet that fragments is way less than the frontal diameter of a bullet that expands, opens really wide and stays together. On that note, so I can get it in my little small brain. You shoot an animal, elk, let's say an elk, mm -hmm. you shoot him with a 200 grain Acubon, mm -hmm. shoot a 200 grain Barnes bullet, or mm -hmm. sorry, a 200 grain uh, burger bullet, Yep. and then a 200 grain Barnes bullet, so sorry. Mm -hmm. 200 grain Acubon, 200 grain Barnes, 200 grain Burger. Okay. What's the difference in that crush size? You're talking about like the permanent wound? Permanent wound channel, sorry. Uh, what impact velocity? Let's just say, for instance, 2250. So 2250, so probably like a 500-yard shot for most yep. guns. Uh, massive, like measurable, right? So this is the other thing where you need to shoot enough animals to see the results and track them. Um, you're looking at with a Barnes... You probably an inch in diameter. That's that's, that's what I, that's what I would that. Yes, it can do more if you hit bone and bone fragments, which are the same as you know lead fragments or whatever. Yeah, but let's you, just say I, for instance that they just slipped the rib. You went right through. You didn't hit any bones. Oh, uh, inch at max. Okay, inch at max is what to expect, right? Yes, you can get some that do way more, and you'll get tons of them that do way less, right? Where it looks like you just ice picked the thing. Um, Acubon, you're probably looking at an inch and a half to two inches in diameter with some, depending on the shape of the bullet where it fragmented a little bit, or the shape of the wound, I should say, um, it, two inches. So you're probably looking at an inch for a Barnes in general. Acubon will be about two inches at that impact velocity. A 200 grain burger if it's a VLD style, so not a target, so it upsets. The difference is the Acubon is going to start expanding almost immediately, sub one inch. So the neck length is less than one inch. Not many people would like what they saw of a mono, like the standard style of E-tip Barnes, at four to six inches of penetration at that impact velocity. It The nose has barely started to open in general. I mean, barely. Like it looks like the cartoon joke of like the muzzle barrel. That You're saying left. four to six inches. Yeah. So like if you shot it and you saw it, you put a gel block six inches wide and you shot it through it or four inches wide – most monos don't even, like their nose is just barely starting to peel open at four inches in. So by the time it's in the lungs, it's really just, it's not even caliber diameter a lot of times. And a lot of these manufacturers, will, when they show you pictures and you see, oh, it works to 1800, look at the bullet they're showing you. It's caliber expansion. It's a 0 0.3 diameter expanded pedal size for a 30 caliber bullet. I mean, it's a joke, right? You're shooting full metal jacket almost. So one inch for a mono generally, one to one and a half inch, two to three inches max for a Acubon if you don't hit bone, and a, a burger that upsets and fragments, five to eight inches. What would the penetration difference be on, like, just on average, you think? Um, so uh, most of them will exit mm -hmm. on, on an elk at that range because your burger is fragmenting enough that the frontal diameter is... And a burger uh, does weird. It doesn't generally fragment from the front like people think. But your frontal diameter is not nearly as big as, say, the Acubon. So even though it loses weight, it's small diameter. So you don't always get big exits, but you do generally get an exit or it's on the opposite side. The wound channel is way wider. Um, Acubons get caught all the time because they got good frontal diameter. Um, and they have high weight retention. So they do a good wound, but they get caught on the exit side all the time. The reason, okay, here's the deal. The reason barns like monos exit is because most of them don't expand that wide. Like you see these pretty pedals and all this stuff and people will recover a bullet and they're like, I shot it in the front shoulder and it went through quote unquote shoulder, lungs, ribs, and caught it in the back hip in the femur. <laughs> and they're like, look at this pretty bullet. And it's like, do you understand it was probably the last three to five inches that bullet opened up like that? Like it might have opened, it wasn't in the first five inches going through the chest, right? When you, mm -hmm. when you talk about the autopsy, like we do these field necropsies, it's, you didn't even see like, you, those are just quick ones, mm -hmm. right? We do layer by layer, take skin off, take hide off. We've deboned them 
Like when we're really doing it and looking at it, we're deboning it as we go layer by layer all the way through it, right? So we see the full bullet track and measuring the permanent wound that's created and not just bloodshot, quote unquote, but like moving the bloodshot stuff out of the way so you can see under the fascia and slicing the the tissue, the muscle tissue to see how far tearing actually went from the bullet path, right? So I wanna be clear, you can kill the holy hell out of animals with a barns. That 100%. However, when seen in large numbers, so culling where you can shoot a lot, so hundreds of animals per type of bullet, they move on average at least twice as far as a rapidly fragmenting heavy for caliber. The animal bullet. does. The animal does, True. on average. Yes, dude, first five animals I ever killed with a barns, caught every bullet. These are white tails. Every bullet... The, the the least one of them ran was 40 and every every the other four were over 80 yards almost no blood now is that normal for a barnes x these are all sub 100 yard shots no that's completely un, un, un normal but if i had only shot those five animals i'd be like barnes sucks they don't expect they don't exit they don't whatever right it's a sample size because the next 60 i shot all exited hmm. right just like you can you can shoot three burgers and be like these things barely penetrated the chest did blah 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 and the next 80 burgers might exit there's variability and you need sample size more some bullets are more consistent than others and some bullets that are very consistent in one scenario are very inconsistent in another scenario like you shoot a barnes or a mono i'm just using barnes because they're the most popular but a mono like that when required by law if you want to follow the law <laughs> and if you want to limit meat damage, that's why you do it uh, with an accepting that dude, if you don't keep that thing, if it impacts below 2,400 feet per second, it's not creating a very big wound. Like just in large numbers, there's way more issues with, with quote unquote expansion below 2,400 ish, 22, 23, depending on caliber and bullet with monos. Right. And like, that's, that's the, the con when we shoot monos, it's cause we're shooting food. Like that's the sole purpose. I can shoot this deer at 300 yards or 200 yards or hundred yards. I want no meat damage. If I want to kill something, I want as much damage as I can create up to a point. The animal, I, the animal I tracked the farthest that was dead was 600 yard shot with a Barnes bullet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're getting down to low impact it was good on the feet, but man, it went a long ways. Yeah, I mean, like a slick trick broadhead yeah. creates as wide of a wound as like most most monos. And I don't like people are like, yeah, yeah, broadheads kill really fast. Mm, yeah, because the animal doesn't run that far, and they run, but they're not super freaked out or anything else. I think if people are honest like a one inch diameter broadhead cutting diameter is not what they want out of a rifle projectile, right? But people have been, you know, the history is really, really greatly increasing muzzle velocities were being possible with weather bees and all these compared, right? Understand that like modern smokeless guns are they're 120 years old or whatever. I mean, they're relatively new inventions here. Yeah, there was a problem in 1940 or 50 with a 300 Weatherby shooting an animal and that bullet coming completely apart because it was designed for something that was shooting 2,000 feet per second, hence the Nosler partition. I was just going to say, you look at, listen to this backstory the Nosler partition is because they were blowing up. Yeah. Well, what you had is when you put that, when you put bullets like that, they're not the way match bullets are made now, by the way, for the vast majority. It's like taking a Sierra Blitz King, you know, 22 cal Blitz King, like literally designed to uh, completely come apart in a grape, right? Not exit a prairie dog. Just upsize that bullet to go in a 30 cal Magnum. Like, oh, you didn't get eight inches of penetration? Who would guess? Right? Of course, they had to learn that. So you get the nozzle of partition, which is probably still the most consistent from muzzle to as far as you want to shoot bullet ever made. I'm not saying it's the best. It's the only one I've never personally even in testing see a failure of. So, um, so did that did the 
Did the match bullet not for hunting thing come from they want to sell their premium hunting line? Or is there, there you know, is it a valid point that sometimes match bullets aren't your best option? It's historical. So I think that what you do is separate basically match bullets into probably three broad categories. Um, so the, the, the tipped plastic tip match bullets we know of ELDM, TMKs, et cetera, they're not match bullets in, in terminal ballistics jargon. They're not match bullets. They're match bullets because they're kept to X, you know, quality control, consistency, whatever, but they're built like a cup and core bullet. They're a lead core bullet with a jack. It may be thick. It may be thin. When that plastic tip, we can talk about what the plastic tip actually does. It does not initiate expansion. Um, it's more consistent. It's more consistent. Well, and when it when it strikes tissue, and you can see this in million frame per second cameras, the plastic tip basically just squeezes itself out. It like poops. It gets squished down, poops itself out of the front of the bullet, and you have this massive hollow point at this point if it's point forward. It's not that the plastic tip drives back into the bullet, bro. It's a plastic. You can squeeze the tip with your hand a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It ain't driving into a metal bullet and initiating expansion, right? It's because it poops itself out. It squeezes out, and you got this huge hollow point showing, right? So you have those so that you can't even really put them in. And then you get burger like VLD style, so that's the J4 jacket. Mm -hmm. Really long, really long nose, the hollow section in front of the bullet with a really thin jacket. That's... That's kind of like the middle ground bullet that was created. The original match bullets, like match kings, um, there was some very there is some variability there. Like, so if you go back in like the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, match kings were pretty variable. I mean, I've killed hundreds of animals with match kings. Um, certain match kings were better than others. The new pointed ones are terrible terminally, right? But if you look at like the, the preeminent, so the 168 grain, 30 cal Sierra Match King or the 175, you can pull bullets from like the 80s with those things where the nose opening is significantly larger than they are now. And it's the same bullet, same model number. The smaller that nose opening, the less consistent the bullets were. So there was a at least some validity up to a point that maybe some match bullets aren't the best. Like... I could kill pretty a lot of stuff with, with Sierra Match Kings, like the old standbys. Would I choose it over any of the plastic tip or burger bullets now? No, right? Because they're just, they're not as consistent. And what I mean by that is you can get some that work. You're not going to, I haven't seen one that just blows up, right? We can talk about that. Like bullets blowing up, bullets don't blow up first. They rapidly expand, fragment, or upset, but it... It creates an image in our mind that gives a false narrative. I've never seen one not penetrate. I'm not saying they can't. I'm saying I haven't seen it. The problem is they either work ideally and they upset early and consistently, or they penetrate 7 to 10, 12 inches before they nose over tumble, and then they're already exited the animal by that point. They're just variable. Gotcha. Right? Most problems with modern bullets – now is a lack of sufficient tissue damage, not a lack of penetration, right? Now that is, having said that, that's heavy for caliber match bullets. If you shoot a 100 grain ELDM in a 6.5 PRC and smoke something at 3,300 feet per second Mohs velocity, you just shot a big varmint bullet. That's all that is. Mm -hmm. Take that same gun, put a 156 Burger in it, a 140 burger or 140 ELDM, you're going to penetrate sufficiently to kill everything, like any big game animal we have. So why do you think they know? I mean, the, 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 the gigs up, those manufacturers know hybrid targets, ELDMs are just smoking animals. And I'm not talking 10, I'm talking thousands, if not hundreds of thousands now. Why do they still hide behind that? So one of the interesting things, there's a manufacturer that makes gear that we both use and like and said the hardest part of their job is educating the public. Mm. So they want to come up with a new idea. It is better. Like there's, you'll see pictures. I, I know you have them, but I have stuff that people ask about that is not commercially sold. A lot of times it's because they'll get so many complaints about that because the public doesn't understand what it's supposed to do. 
right? So that's a, that's a big part. Mm. So let's take, give me a bullet manufacturer so I'm not picking on somebody. Spear. Spear. Okay, so they make, Spear makes really good bullets. The, the gold dots and the Federal Fusions are the same exact bullet, right? They're not super high BC. I think they got the Deep Impact, which is kind of their new long range bullet that you can't buy because you can't buy any other products. Um, in order for Spear to educate the general public that a tipped match bullet that behaves like an ELDM is an acceptable killing bullet, people equate how well a bullet kills by what it looks like when it was done killing. I pulled it out of the animal. I got this beautiful mushroom. It doesn't matter that the animal lived for 10 minutes before it fell over. It's beautiful. It killed great. I kill this animal. It literally, the bullet hits and it flops but I can't find a piece of that bullet left in it and it only made it to the offside. It failed. That's the problem. People aren't looking at what matters. They only look at what marketing has told them. And there's been such a push by gun writers and people that should be knowledgeable and manufacturers that you, you're fighting a real uphill battle with that, right? Like, so, and this is kind of, this is my opinion now, is if a manufacturer says this one bullet is great for winning matches and smokes the crap out of animals, you just sold one bullet. If I tell you this bullet is great for winning matches, but to shoot an elk, you need this bullet, you sold two. Mm. Oh, this great bullet is great for winning matches. This bullet is great for shooting an elk. This one's the bullet you want to shoot deer. You just shot, you just sold three. Like that's just reality, right? The reality is, is you take a 225 ELDM from a 300 wind mag, there is no animal in North America you can't turf from contact to a thousand yards with that thing. Like it's just not. Now, is the bullet going to be pretty when you pull it out? Absolutely not. Who cares? Right? That, so That makes the most sense to me is there's always, at the end of the day, it's money involved. I think it's that. I think it's a perception. Like they've done such a good job educating I say they colloquial, right? It's it's in 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 quotations. The public has been so indoctrinated into the ads with pretty bullets that you'd have to you have to re-educate an entire generation or multi-generation that that is not what matters in a bullet. It's like, for instance, there are manufacturers that are on podcasts now, some really good ones. That straight up tell you bullet energy has no effect on killing. Zero. There's no correlation to how much energy hit that animal and, how, and that number telling you anything about it. And yet their customers are so indoctrinated to the energy, they still put it down. So I want minimum penetration for, okay, so first off, let's talk about people act like shoulders are this thing. Mm -hmm. I never understood that because I've, I've butchered thousands of big game animals, right? I did it for a year for a company just because I wanted to learn how to do it correctly. And I remember the first time, like I actually looked and realized how thin a deer's shoulder scapula is. First off, there's two parts. There's the humerus, which is the leg bone that attaches with the big knuckle, if you will, the joint, and then the flat scapula, which is what people call the shoulder, mm -hmm. right? That flat scapula. It's almost like flexible. Dude, you can see through it. Yeah. Right? And so it's like elk, and they're like, oh my God, the bullet splashes on the shoulder. Uh, how, do you guys not ever look at the animals you kill? First off, look at the shoulder. Like, I show this with everybody that comes out, and we shoot, we shoot a lot of elk. I'm like, hold the scapula up to the sky, put your hand behind it. You can see your hand through it. An elk's scapula is thinner than a standard piece of cardboard. <laughs> I saved a few of them for you. Appreciate you. Yeah, so I do that every time. So then, like, moose. Oh, my God, moose. Dude, you could see. Uh, I took a scalpel, a, a Havilon scalpel blade, just the blade, right? I had gloves on, cut-resistant gloves, and I could push the blade through the scapula of a moose. That bone is not this armor-plated thing that people, like, that is factually incorrect. It's cardboard, right? If you can just take a knife and lightly stab it and go through it, there's no bullet at 2,000 feet per second that's got a problem with that, if it's a legitimate bullet, right? So it's really how big is the muscle and the animal total. 
So people act like elk are big, right? They're much bigger than a deer, mm-hmm. but they're not that much deeper than a deer. Like their width is not that much wider. So like that, the biggest elk I've personally seen is the one that P and W Gator killed with his uh, bow, right? Northern Idaho. That thing is massive body, just huge. It's still like 14 inches wide. Like it's, they're not that wide. They're slab sided, right? So it's 14 inches wide. We talked about this. There was a podcast with some people talking about six to 10 inches of muscle from any angle before you hit the shoulder bone. That is not real. That is, that's called an elephant. So we're clear. <laughs> it's about like two inches. So the, 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 at any angle from the last four or five bulls we've killed, any angle directly into the scapula sub four inches. Sub four. Any sub angle. four. At any angle we can do it of pure muscle. Sub four inches. Now that's real four inches, not the male four inches. That's a chick four. Yeah, yeah, chick four. That's a better way to say it, <laughs> right? So here, here's part of the problem is not understanding what a bullet does, not being good enough to know what happened when that bullet hit, i.e. my shooting ability. I don't see it because it recoils too much. This kind of goes into the caliber thing we were about to start talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, and not understanding like an animal. So the spinous process so if you look at a, a skinned elk, a boned out elk, for instance, and a deer has it too. If you, okay, so boom, you see an impact and it's six to seven inches from the top of the back. So it's six to seven inches in the body cavity, elk runs off. Good shot, right? Be honest. Most people would be like, yeah, that's a good mm-hmm. shot. Tie lungs. Yeah. Dude, yeah, you're above the spine. A spinous process on an elk is seven to nine inches. So that's the little spiny bones that come off the spine. And if you bone one out in the field, you can see that. The chest cavity starts seven to nine inches below the top of the back. If we don't put a bullet in the chest cavity, you didn't affect the lungs, right? So we get these quote unquote, the bullet splashed, right? And what, and normally it's followed by, they almost never recover the animal just so we're clear, right? So I always wonder how you determine this without recovering the animal. Because even when we get it on video and we have legitimate world-class spotters who on paper can call shots with an inch of where they hit it, six to 800, 900 yards, just by the trace. We don't even trust that unless we recover the animal. And we can see it in video. We can watch it over and over and over again because you will eventually recover one and be like, dude, that didn't hit anywhere near where I thought it did, right? But what is it almost always? It's usually they shot, it splashes on the shoulder, knocks the animal down, then the animal gets up and runs off but didn't penetrate the shoulder. No, you shot high. You hit the spinous processes, stunned it. That's why it fell. And then it gets back up and it runs off. It never touched the scapula, which is really what we're talking about. And the top of the scapula in a lot of angles is in line. Like there's a way to hit the top edge of the scapula and not enter the chest cavity, right? It just goes over the top of the spine and the spinous processes. You hear this in archery, like the dead space, above the lungs, but below the spine. Okay, that's not how tissue works. That's called a, a tension pneumothorax or a, a humo pneumothorax or whatever. That's, that's a sucking chest wound. If there's air in the pleural cavity, the chest cavity in an animal, that's a sucking chest wound. That's lethal. And that goes from the bottom of their chest all the way up to their, with their, uh, so, their spine. So when you look at the lungs, the best way to think of this on an animal's chest is take a Ziploc bag, put some liquid in it, some like liquid soap, squeeze all the air out of it so there's zero air, and then zip it up so it's airtight, right? Then try to separate the sides, try to separate it apart. There's a mechanical lock with the mucous membrane, the membrane that's in there. It is stuck to the sidewalls. If it isn't stuck, that's a sucking chest wound. Air gets in between the ribs and the lungs. It, it's a problem, mm-hmm. right? There's no space. Well, because you start collapsing, your air pressure collapses the lung. That's correct. You get too much pressure, it pushes the lung over, blah, 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 right? So there's no space. If you put a bullet in a chest cavity, well, I guess we could back up. It is entirely possible to put a hole through two lungs and the animal survive. Just like humans can get shot in both lungs and survive with no medical attention. In order for that to be lethal, it has to... Uh, you have to have so much damage to the lungs that you impair the lung function 
so that they suffocate, or you cause so much damage, they get so much blood in the pleural cavity, or they lose so much blood from an exahole or whatever that they exanguate. Uh, I always mess this word up. They bleed out. Um, it's a big word. It's a big word. I know the I know the word, but I always mess Extenuate it up. Extinguate or ex yeah, I know what the word is yep. too. Um, it's a fire extinguisher. It's a fire extinguisher, or uh, you got to let enough air in that you impair the function, right? So, like, bears do this a lot, just specifically because I'm looking at a picture of a bear, but they got enough fat and tissue, it covers holes up. If you don't suck air in, no air gets out, no blood gets out, right? So, they can live a long time. And we have shot deer in the lungs with rifles, archery, bows, all of it, and then recovered those deers months to a year later. Like, it, it is possible. Now, how often does that happen? Dude, it's like five deer and probably four or 5,000 deer that we've had that happen. But it can happen. That's not saying it's an excuse to say, man, it's probably survived. No, it probably didn't. <laughs> Most of the time, you just shot high and went over the spine. That's what, yeah. and you tickled that's what happens. You tickled. I've done that. I've, I yeah. personally have done that, but I witnessed two people do it, and it's they just drop. So one of the telltale signs is if – the animal, like front to back, so you're looking at it sideways, if the butt hits the ground the same time as its head, you have not killed that animal more than likely. But if the butt hits first? So we call it we call it the AMAX flop, right? But it's so if the head, what happens is like, let's say you, you permanently affect the spinal cord. So you hit the spinal cord in the chest. So you sever the spinal cord or you damage it permanently. From that point, back so the, the the electrical signals start at the brain and work down from that point back everything curls up and tightens up or completely relaxes right it could be both generally completely relaxes but what you see with animals is that you hit the spinal cord their back legs pull up into their chest so their butt drops down which forces their head up and then they smash their head down right they do that like whiplash yeah it's a whi it's exactly what yeah. it looks like right it's like you're taking a snake or a, a a bull whip and smacking it and that's because you severed the spinal cord it is permanently done so i always like if the if you see the butt hit the ground before the head like boom butt head done just stay on them you're probably good but stay on them right if the whole thing collapses at the same time or it looks like it was tipped over completely away from you You've went above the spine, almost guaranteed you're going to need to shoot it again, right? So, like, now if we see that, if I just see the whole animal fall, like, in line with itself, we just put another one immediately in the ground. We have chased so many animals that that's happened. It's not even funny. The last one was just a few years ago. Buddy killed a uh, buck antelope. Looked like a good shot. To me, it looked like a good shot. We were kind of up high. I was like, dude, it's a high shoulder, but we're good. I mean, he just fell. But I knew better. And I even told him, I'm like, Everything hit the ground at the same time. Ah, we're good. We lasted probably two or three minutes, and he finally gets up, and everybody's high-fiving, and that little trucker starts getting up and walking. <laughs> and I'm like, God, shoot him again. As soon as we're done, he just looks at me. He's like, mm, we knew better. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, we knew. Now, you know, if they hit the ground like that, we just put another bullet in them. I usually put, put two in them anyways. Um, So... We were talking about like what to look for in a bullet. All right, so there's a, I don't know what type of shot are you willing to take? People always say, well, I want a deep penetrating controlled expansion bullet in case I have to, to shoot a steep quartering shot and it's gotta go through the guts or the grass bag or the Or they're worried about a close shot. Or they're worried about a close shot. So let's, let's address that. I'm not saying a bullet can't explode, or let me rephrase that. I'm not saying a bullet can't expand so rapidly and fragment that you get limited penetration. In other words, it splashes, quote unquote. I have never seen a heavy for caliber tip match bullet or burger bullet. In testing, including through glass, which is the hardest substrate to get through, it is the most damaging to a bullet. At 3,000 feet per second or lower impact speed, right? And there's some buffer there on the top. Not make it into the chest cavity of an animal or not penetrate deep enough in testing to not make it into the chest cavity of an animal. I'm not saying it can't happen. The difference is in testing, I can take a super hard bullet, a mono. The amount of failures to expand or open up 
is it's hot. They're the highest. They have the highest quote unquote failure rate of any bullet. Right. So like take a Nosler E tip, you get below 22, 23, 2400 feet per second in there, dude, it, it can be up to 50% don't open beyond like caliber size. Hmm. Right. Like it's not, people don't see this because you don't catch that many of them. The reason you don't catch that many of them is because they didn't create enough frontal diameter to stop. Like that's a small diameter at high velocity. Right. So again, we talk like this. People, especially in the East, but everybody makes elk into this like magical target. They're just tissue. They're not much wider than a big white tail. Um, if, put this perspective, 10 inches of penetration. If you put that bullet in the chest cavity, the front half of an elk, it's making it to the lungs. 10 inches. And I wouldn't hunt with a bullet with 10 inches. That's a varmint bullet, right? But there's no point if you put it in the ribs, it's not making it to the lungs, including through the dreaded shoulder, which is nothing. So we always say this, we're like, okay, shoulders stop bullets. So let's grab cow shoulders, cow scapulas, which are way, there's nothing on a, a wild herbivore except a buffalo that looks like a cow, right? In fact, as far as bone density, even if you're talking the knuckle, there's nothing like it. Um, there's no bullets that splash on a cow's shoulder. When you like fresh, Fresh slaughtered cow scapula, so it's wet and moist and just like it should be. Like 22s go through them like butter. There's nothing that stops them. It's it's so ridiculous. I don't know where this comes from in modern. And I think it's just repeated as an excuse for why things don't go right. Now, old school guys used to always hit the shoulder too. They would say, I want to anchor them. Yeah, sure. Oh. That works great. But a lot of times when they do that, you shoot high. So this goes into what we're zeroing and group sizes. Like, most misses are high. There's a lot of, there's even some, some government testing and government research projects that are, or if you know how to search, you can find them. Most misses are high. People miss high. And it's primarily due to the fact that we, we zero our guns. So the bullets rise above their line of sight at some point, AKA two inches high or maximum point blank range or whatever. Well, guess what happens when I hit high when I aim at an animal? Hit I'm sure. back into the I'm in, well, I'm into the spinous process above the chest cavity. You see a lot of the online stuff where somebody makes a shot and it's a spinal cord shot and they're high five and saying, "I mean, the animal's going to die or it's yeah. dead," and it's uh, that's a terrible shot because you miss by a foot. Unless you're aiming for it, right? Like I well, mean, they're, there's there's you know, the gun the, the gun works, dudes. When they were shooting burgers, would tell you we're shooting high shoulder which is trying to catch the, the scapula and the spine where it dips down into the chest cavity. That's awesome, bro. If you hit it, it's a boom flop, right? That A-max flop thing. But it's so easy to miss. Like, and that's the, yeah. when you get into group sizes of guns and the reality of shooting, like that's just not. People miss high a lot too because they don't compensate for inclination or. Yeah, inclination, declination, yeah. it's all of it, right? Like we, I mean, we bag, the, the back end drops. And there's but, so every wanna, everything except distance, right? So everything other than holding high on an animal or dialing, everything we do with a gun, with a rifle causes us to impact high. Hmm. If I flinch, it's high. Think about how the guns are generally stabilized off a backpack, right? The flinch drops the buttstock down into the left, which causes high right hits the bag slipping, all of that. Almost everything results in high hits. Hmm. Well, I want people, you know, not not knocking out gun works or best of us. I want the YouTube influencers to start calling their shots so we can call their bullshit. <laughs> 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 kind of like, you know, with the, <laughs> the eight ball. Yeah, that's good. correct, right? Yep. Because we do it all the time. So, like, what I, what I look for even on a note is I want minimum of 14 inches of penetration. I'd really like 16 to 18. That's in gel, and that that turns out to be the same thing. About the same. Okay, so so we're clear. That means as soon as you do that, there are quite a few, if not a lot, of two twenty four diameter bullets that meet that spec from three thousand feet per second muzzle to eighteen hundred or lower. So that can be matched. That penetration can be matched by every centerfire gun made. Basically, it's a bullet. And as soon as we forget the caliber and we just measure the wound created, we're now talking about real. So saying that a 300 Magnum is better than a 243 is theoretical. It's not until you measure the bullet and tissue can you say better or worse, right? And then you, gotta, you have to clarify what is better or worse to you. 
There are bullets that we shoot that you and I shoot. I'm guessing you do too, Jake. People will look at that and say they're an abject failure. And it's like, okay, that wound was a soda can pushed 27 inches through an elk from a pipsqueak gun at 803 yards. What about that as a failure? Well, it bananaed, it tumbled. I don't care what it looks like. I care what the damage it did to the animal, right? So for me, when we start talking about like 14-ish inches, it will kill a moose, elk, it doesn't matter. Like the shoulder, whatever, dude, you're gonna get through it. It's not that big of a deal. And this isn't theoretical, this isn't I like, I think, we're talking about hundreds to thousands of animals with these bullets specifically trying to get one to splash and it doesn't happen. And I'm not, but again, we're talking heavy for caliber match bullets. I'm not talking hundred grain, six, five or 120 grain, 30 cal out of a 300 mag, right? Like it's 115s, it's 147s. Then you Yeah. Go. Just look at the, basically the highest weight they make for that bullet in a match bullet. And that's mm. kind of where you're at. Right. Mm. And there's a, there's a round number. You can definitely go, too heavy. I think you've been pretty critical of the 195 burger and 7 mil. Was that correct? Yeah. They, and I think that's more you of a factor. You don't like they, 7 mil. I don't period. like 7 mils, but the two that I have had, the 180 LDMs yeah. did great. The 195s, I don't think, and I just, I don't do the autopsies, and mm -hmm. I do now more than I've ever yeah. done, but I don't think they open all the time. There's a lot of that. There's something not right because they're yeah. very small wound channels yeah, for a and, burger. And we can, and we definitely talk about that, right? Because especially when you're talking bullets that tumble, which, so we're clear, burgers t tumble, right? Most bullets do, but burgers definitely do. Mm -hmm. um, jacket th thickness, the cavity in the nose, all of that comes into effect of where that bullet fragments, which is what we're looking for, for in that kind of bullet is a fragmentation. So the reason, so we're clear, the reason fragmentation creates a larger permanent wound than a bullet that holds together is because even if it hits a sufficient uh, impact velocity to get some tearing off that temporary stretch cavity, it can only be so wide. But if I go from the center of the point of impact and that tissue stretches out like that rubber band, and then a the one grain of jacket or bullet hits the edge of that rubber band, it pops it. So as you're going through, just imagine like, yeah, all that tissue is like stretched, and then you have these little fragments that are going two to four inches from the wound channel little cutting. Razor blades, yeah. yeah, that's what happens. The, to address this other thing, because um, it, it, it's just a factual lie. It is factually incorrect. A, a small piece of lead, if you shoot it in the chest, is not going to be found in the, ham, in the ham. Lead does not, when those, those small fragments that people are worried about eating... There's so much nonsense that goes into that. But watch ballistic gelatin and understand what that is. You're not having fragments that fly out of the lead unless it's a big piece of fragment. It doesn't have the mass to penetrate more than a couple of inches from the wound channel. So those things that 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 image they always think they were placed there on purpose, they were cherry picked pieces. There's some that were cherry picked. Mm -hmm. There's some where they wash the body cavity out. Uh -huh. Right or or you shot it, it got fragments in it, and they show the chest that's been yeah, it's in like X -ray. twelve inches. Out. Yeah, and it's everywhere, right? Yeah. Well, it's because it's liquid inside the chest, dude. Hmm. Right? Like, I mean, you have to understand how the bullets work. To, if I shoot uh, an elk in the shoulder and the bullet fragments ridiculously, it cannot travel like a piece that I'm going to chew on that I wouldn't notice is not going to travel more than a couple of inches from the center of the wound. It can. It doesn't have the mass. Even though you'll get bloodshot and all this damage four to five inches from the wound, that piece that can travel that deep, like people are arguing two different things. They're saying we don't like lead fragmenting bullets because they don't penetrate deep enough because they don't have enough mass. And then those same people are saying, but you'll get le tiny leg fragments that you can't even see that are 20 inches away from the boon ch bullet channel. The point of impact is like you can't have both, man. Mm. Like that's not real. Fragments, even from some of the most rapid, they're within like six inches of the bullet wound. Like those people have an agenda. There's a lot the of people that have the same yeah. people worried about eating a lead fragment are eating Twinkies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm, love Twinkies. I got a quick what if or what happened. Okay. 
Jim Carr's daughter, yep. shot an elk, 500 and something yards, yep. 147, 6.5 PRC. So she, thick nose, got it. She's shooting at a broadside bull, but there's a bunch of cows. They're, mm-hmm. they're chasing cows. Right when she pulled the trigger, perfectly broadside, it spun to chase a cow. Like it okay. spun, yep. hit the, well, this is what happened because we went over because I've been paying attention a little more since I've watched your little autopsy. So I, <laughs> I wish I'd have took pictures. But it looked to me like it hit the top of the hip socket. Yep. But a piece had to have go through and it like tore up the top of the, uh, the went through the uh, tenderloins mm-hmm. and top, it went through the diaphragm and yep. like hit some lung. Yep. How is that possible? And, and if it would have been a match bull or if it would have been a bar, a mono or a, you know, a uh, bonded bullet, yep. what would it have done different? And it did massive damage to the hip. I mean, the bullet just dropped. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then I was like, man, we're going to shoot it again. But we got over there as dead as yep. dead as doornail. Yep. But it went all the way through and did quite a bit of damage mm-hmm. in the chest. So that's almost two feet. Yeah. What's, how's that? How's, I mean, that's just a one off, but I mean. Well, but it's not though. Ricochet. So you yeah, could have, like you could have tri- asked me without telling me, you could have said, what happens at 500 yards if I shoot a 6.5 PRC with a 147 LDM and it hits the hip socket angling it away? And yeah, like, no, the elk is away. flopping. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. what's going to happen. Right? So like. This is where it comes in to shot angle. So people are like, I want X deep, super deep penetrating high weight retention in case I have to shoot through the guts to get to the lungs, or I have to shoot a a rear end, a Texas hard shot, rear end all the way forward. So we're clear, the grass in a deer, like just it's it's food that it's been eating can stop most bullets. There's no guarantee. You can shoot a 416 Remington. Magnum with a 400 grain Barnes. There's no guarantee it's getting through the stomach. Like grass is like the best bullet stopper ever. Just so we're clear. Like if you, I mean, it is, it's, it's like sand. It's wild. So there is no bullet that you can guarantee or even have a 99% chance of making it through the stomach into the lungs. Again, if I would have only seen a few animals, I might say that's nonsense. We're not talking a few. Like, Remove ethics. If you want to know what something does, you have to test it. So we did that this year with another bullet, which I'm sure we're going to get into in a range and a cartridge that people thought was insane and do think it's insane. And I'm definitely not saying you should do it. But to find the limits, you have to find the limits, right? And uh, you can catch Barnes X bullets in stomachs just as easy as anything else, right? For the same reason. So the reason is because as that bullet fragments, it drops because you smash the hip socket and the spine is right there. Um, and you had a small piece that had enough frontal, that was small enough in the frontal diameter to penetrate. It didn't hit anything hard. Like that happens a lot. If it would have been lower and you shot that through the hip into the into the stomach, it probably would have got caught in the, in the, the stomach, one of the main stomachs with grass in it. Um, but it still would have dropped because you, like you hit the femur, like mm-hmm. from personal knowledge, a, a smashed femur sucks, right? <laughs> um, oh, that's so, funny. So it's like this. Don't choose a bullet for what may happen. What you're like these, these theoreticals. If you're not going to shoot an elk in the butt facing away from you, don't worry about what the bullet does when it hits the butt. That is a stupid way to approach this. I personally shoot animals and I put the bullet into the chest. If I can't see it go into the chest or the neck. So I'm not saying if an animal's facing away and I'm going to shoot it facing away, just shoot it in the back of the head or the, no, I'm not saying that don't shoot animals in the head. You get lots of wounded, shoot them in the neck right above the spine, right? Like that's what I'm going to do. There's no, I, I'm not trying to get through the hips. That's just dumb. Um, and what I mean by dumb is it has a high probability of failure. Mm-hmm. Right. If I can see the chest, I can hit the chest. The bullet's going to get in there. Having said that, if I did have to take a rear end shot to stop an animal that was already hit, or I just decided that was acceptable to me, having done it and seen it done hundreds of times, absolutely positively would rather have a massively fragmenting bullet that penetrates 16 or so inches than any bullet that will penetrate two feet. Because it's always a two shot thing, minimum. You hit them, they drop, you put another one in them to kill them. I'm removing ethics here. I'm not telling people to do this. In fact, I would tell people don't do this. If that was the task, 
I want as much damage as I can for the first foot because if I miss the actual spinal cord, if I have that wide fragmenting bullet, wide wound created by a fragmenting bullet, it's going to affect the spinal cord. It's going to drop. They mm-hmm. absolutely, if you have to take rear end shots, shoot them straight in the hips and have a big fragmenting bullet. That works. But you're going to shoot it again. Makes right? Makes sense. But I, the reason I brought that, yeah. that particular shot up is I don't, I wouldn't tell anybody to shoot something in the ass, you know, in the first shot. Yeah. But I don't think any other bullet's actually going to keep the animal's dead when we got over there. Unless it hits the feet, you know, the femoral artery or anything. But yeah. If I shoot a match bullet or you shoot a mono or you shoot a, a uh, like an AccuBomb. Yeah. Bonded. It's going to stop right. I mean, it's going to break the hell out of it, but it's going to stop right there. Then you're going to have to shoot again. Yeah. And I would say if you shot a hundred elk in the same shot, you can't say that that bullet's going to consistently make it to the chest. No, it's just luck. No, I'm just saying that's where a match bullet kind of helped you out. So that, so I'll say this. um, So I guess infamously, maybe the 223 on big game kind of thing. um, That would not be a thing with me with, with monos. A deep penetrating, narrow wound creating mono bullet. Well, that's just not okay for me. Like I'm not choosing that for any caliber. But what makes the 223 so effective or 22 cows so effective on things up to elk or moose is the bullet itself. So we have these these criteria or or um, things that a bullet can do, penetration, temporary stretch, cavity, whatever. It creates a wound channel. As soon as we let go of caliber, we just measure the wound channel. And this gets into calibers, right? So everybody thinks that I hate big guns. I'm going to willing to bet that I shoot more magnums per year than almost anyone. And I despise them. Now, I despise them because it beats the crap out of me, and they almost all muzzle braked, and there's no way to make that hearing safe, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I don't shoot as much why as I are used they, to. Why are they muzzle braked instead of suppressed? Oh, uh, so we'll get into that, because uh, this, uh, yeah. So, well, there's there's a bunch of reasons for that, right? So, up until recently, most suppressors couldn't handle big magnums correctly. Uh, so, uh, muzzle brake will reduce 50 to 60% of the muzzle of the recoil. Generally, depending on the muzzle break, you have a good one. Um, so a suppressor doesn't do that. It's 30 to 40% max. Um, what it does is makes recoil impulse longer. So it might be the same total force, but it's over a longer span of time. So it, it creates the, the feeling that you got pushed versus smacked. Now, the issue that you run into with muzzle breaks there is no way to take either one of those guns. There's nothing you can put in your ears over your ears. Double plugs, muffs, that's not hearing safe. Every time you fire that gun, you're getting permanent hearing damage. Right? So you take earplugs. Go ahead. What? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you take earplugs, right? You're over, you're way over 170 decibels at the muzzle with those brakes. Especially right? with those short 24 inch barrels. Yep. Yep. Um, so you do that. A plugs, let's say you put in your plugs correctly, which almost nobody does because they don't want read the directions, but let's say they're actually put in correctly. That's 25 to 26 decibel reduction. So we're at, I'll bet money you're at 175 to 180 with those guns. Um, okay, so sweet. You're now at 165, right? Or 155 if you did it, everything perfect. When you add muffs over that, it doesn't double it. It doesn't even equal it. You're like five to 10 decibels. So with plugs and muffs, you're looking at 30 to 40 decibels max of reduction. So you took a 180 to right at 140, maybe, if you did everything right. That's the problem with brakes. Now, are there uses for brakes? Absolutely. Right? A 50 BMG with a suppressor, they've got some good ones now. They suck. You still have to wear earplugs. Right? But it's not as bad. Mm. That's the big deal. And then big guns, big cartridges, lots of heat. Mirage off the suppressor starts affecting you, right? So when I have to shoot those things, like I'll build up a wall around the barrel to keep the blast from hitting me, whether it's sandbags or backpacks or whatever. So it stops the noise right past the barrel, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but yeah, I don't shoot as much magnums as I used to. So I'm probably in the four to 7,000 rounds of like 30 cal mags and bigger a year. 
it used to be into like the 20 to 25,000 rounds a year because it's not necessary anymore. I still have to shoot them. I still shoot them, but I don't like it. Shoot a lot of two, 22 cows, a lot of six fives, a lot of six mils for a reason, a lot of 308. Um, but people think I don't like big guns. That's not the truth. I just like things that work. And so when we're talking calibers, it's like, can you make a 30 cal create a larger wound than a seven millimeter? Yes. Can a seven millimeter create a larger wound than a six five? Yes. Can a six five create a larger wound than a six mil? Yes. So on and so forth. Six mil is going to create, a, can create a larger wound than a 22 cal. You simply have more bullet to do more work. Here's the deal. So I show pictures of like 30 cal bullets maximized. So like if you, <coughs> you take a 300 Win Mag, 300 PRC, 30 Nosler, 300 rum. So you were talking about 300 rums earlier, right? So way back when the first legit long range gun I built was a 300, it's called a 300 Tomahawks, 300 Remington, Ultra Mag improved AI, right? Like 108 grains of powder. 34 inch barrel plus a muzzle brake, so 36 inches, inch and a quarter diameter. Um, I'm not saying you should reproduce these loads. The loads, we loaded it with a 220 grain match king at 3,400 feet per second muzzle velocity. Um, the real load we used was like 3,250. I thought it'd be real neat to put a 178 grain A max in that thing. <laughs> um, it was somewhere at like 3,800, 3,900 feet per second muzzle velocity. When you hit deer, and I'm not saying this is right. This was like testing and like what will bullets do? We didn't know this was gonna happen like this. Um, the only thing that kept the deer together was the skin on the top and the back. <laughs> <laughs> like you could physically take a basketball and push it through the wound. There's no spine left. If you hit bone, it was over. Okay, does anybody want that? Is that acceptable in something we're gonna kill? No. Well, that's a 30 cal maximized. So then what do we do? Well, that creates too much damage. I need a different bullet. So then we start choking the bullet down and, and reducing what it can physically do by making it quote unquote harder, tougher. So we're artificially narrowing the wound channel to come to something acceptable. So why not just go to a smaller round and maximize that round? So if I like, Here's what we have, and I don't know that you've seen any, but I remember when we started shooting 223s at animals, and it was kind of ridiculous, a big game, because I was one of the people when I had guys that were like, well, why why can't we use my AR, my M4 on animals? And it's like, well, it's 223. That's kind of marginal, blah, blah. And they're like, mm, it's 200-pound mammal, 200-pound mammal. Ah, crap, you're right. So then I started <laughs> shooting them and I was like, man, these things work just like everything else. Who cares? And then the 77 grain TMK came out. That one was, a, I knew how that bullet was designed. Like the largest wound channel you can get and still get su sufficient penetration for 200 pound, 250 pound mammals. That completely brought 223 into a new spectrum, right? But here's the deal. No one, including every person that has ever come and said a 223 is too marginal, it's too small, blah, blah, blah. No one has walked up and said that's too small when they looked at an animal. The normal response is what the fuck, that is wasting meat. <laughs> right? So Ryan, this goes back to Ryan challenging me, was how far would I shoot an elk with a 223 and a 77 grain? Remember that <laughs> this summer? Oh, no, I remember. Yeah, and, he, and I'm like, further than anybody should shoot. And I'm not saying this like you should shoot this far. I'm not. It's my whole thing with long-range shooting, period. Uh, most people people should not be doing it, generally. And what it, it, I just said that, and you're like, well, how far? And I'm like, way further than people should be. And you said 800, and I said, sure. And I said it before I even thought about it. I said 801. No, you said 800, and I said yes. And then you said... 801 or you don't have you're full of it and would, it became would, this thing I would and never it, say that what's that i would never say such a thing yeah that. right and so it, we talked about it and it was so one i'm not going to do something that i'm not extremely confident in the end result so i've seen the tmks down to like 1700 1600 feet per second impact i knew it was gonna be way below that and i'm like we can do it but I got him and I said, fine, I'm going to use my Mark 12. So a semi-auto gun, that's a 
basically a competition rifle that can be shot really fast. And the caveat to this, we're not finding elk and backing up. No, 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 no. That's just, if it's there, take it. If, if right. I had one elk tag by the time I got to that gun, if it would have been at 600, I would have shot it and told you to bite me. It just didn't happen that way. It happened at 803. Um, I, I knew what the end result, there's going to be a dead elk pretty quick. But I also knew that because of the shooter, the gun, and the spotters, I could put two in the chest and go straight to the neck and drop it, right? Like, we're not, I'm not saying this is what you should do. I'm saying we only know what marginal is by finding the limit. Um, yeah, two shots, easy peasy, done. And I didn't have to shoot him in the neck. First shot was through the scapula, stood there, started swaying, another one in the spine, it fell. Um, so for people to understand wound channels, this is a 77 grain bullet hitting at something like 300 feet per, uh, 300 foot pounds of energy, quote unquote energy, and like 1300 feet per second impact speed. Somewhere around there. Somewhere. So just hold up a 20 ounce water bottle and imagine that going through an entire elk. It went through the onside scapula, both lungs, clipped the spine, broke the other scapula in half and was caught under the skin. We just found it when we butchered it up. That's the first shot. Um, when I say it nicked the spine, I mean like the meat under the spine. It didn't physically go through the spine. The second shot, I mean, this was quick. We got it on video. It was boom. It moved like 30 yards behind some elk coming in front of it. So we're talking like five seconds later. Boom. That one hit towards the back of the ribs, hit the spine and dropped it. <laughs> All right. So you... Even that, when we walked up, nobody who was there didn't look at it and say, that's not enough wound. It's still bigger than it needs to be. It's bigger than any broadhead ever. Am I saying shoot elk at 800 yards, 223? No. Don't shoot elk at 800 yards. Most people don't shoot enough for that. Right? But it's saying that, okay, we look at what the bullet physically does versus this some preconceived notion of caliber. Now, okay, let's say you're one that does maximize the 30 cal. So what do you what did you shoot this year, Jake? Three in a rum, 215 hybrid, and a 33XC with a Oof. 300 OTM. All right. So we got some big bullets. Yes. Now, to be clear, neither one of those bullets are gonna create the widest wounds, right? Because they're 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 thick jacketed bullets. They're gonna go in, tumble, fragment. You're generally gonna get exits, pretty good exits generally. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the wider wounds are going to be like a 225 ELDM for the 30 cal and like a 285 for the 338, right? But have you ever seen what they do at 3,000 feet per second impact on bone on close animal? No. You're, th yeah. it, you're throwing the, the, the half that the bullet hit in away, right? So when we talk about like temporary stretch cavities, you're using things that are maximizing those guns. Okay, so if you buy if you buy a 300 wind mag and you go elk hunting and you put a TSX in it or a TT any mono and you take normal shots, so even say 500 yards, I mean keep that thing above 2500 2400-ish feet per second is what I would highly suggest. That's what I that's my lower limit. Um but it is creating a smaller wound by orders of magnitude than the 223 bullets we shoot at the same impact speed. Hmm. Now, if you take that gun and you maximize that bullet, so you shoot an ELDM in it, and I'm just using that as an example, like a, anywhere from a 195 to a 225 and a 300 Win Mag, PRC, whatever, that's fine. But very few people get up there and look at that animal and are, are happy with the meat damage that is created. Right, but let's compare those two. So the width of, on the low end to the big end, right? So maximize 224 diameter bullet at say 2000 feet per second, right? It, it, they're the same across the board, but say a 223, 224 diameter bullet is a four inch wide wound, still goes 16 to 20 inches. Like your 6.5 is like a five inch, maybe. Your seven millimeters, like five and a half, six inches. Your biggest 30 cows with the best bullets are like seven inches. And it's like, oh my God, that's twice what a 224 does. Yeah, sure. Except it's not big enough to matter. And what I, so what I'm saying by that is if you shoot 
those like ELDMs, big ELDMs fast on deer. Like I was talking about with the Tomahawk or even a three and a wind mag. The, the chest cavity of like small deer is like seven to nine inches tall or antelope and like 15 inches wide. The temporary stretch cavity, so the permanent damage created by those fragmenting bullets, is larger than the chest cavity is. So if you put that bullet in the front half, you have an extremely high probability that the spinal cord is being affected without ever being touched, right? <laughs> so say say 80 to 90% of a deer's chest cavity, any of the surface area that you could hit, that bullet can damage the spinal cord without ever touching it. You can't do that in elk. <laughs> an elk's twice as big, tall, right? So you have... 30% maybe of the surface area, even with a big bullet to do that. Now, that's not saying it's not better. It absolutely is. So if you're going to shoot a, like, this is what we talk about. If you're shooting a big 30 cal mag, shoot a bullet that maximizes it. Big burger, big ELDM, ELDX, something like that, TMKs. If you're gonna artificially choke that bullet down, get lower recoil for it because everyone shoots less recoil better than more recoil. That's not, there's no human alive that flinches less getting kicked in the face by a horse than by a puppy. <laughs> but get real here, right? That's a, that's a horse over there. Yeah, that's a horse right there, yeah. <laughs> that thing's um, Okay, so. Yeah, you can get more damage with a 30 cal and better, better margin for error. And this is where I started because I grew up where you shoot magnums. Uh, a 7 millimeter rim mag was marginal for southern whitetail deer. They just didn't know better. I mean, like we killed a lot of magnums, a lot of deer. 338 was good. You know, 300 wind mag was good. 338 was better. 300 rums was the jam. 3378 for 70-yard shots on whitetail deer. <laughs> um, 300 rum is still the jam. Yeah, yeah oh, it is still the jam. <laughs> Seven mag suck. So it kind of, <laughs> you have this whole thing about like, like I learn from every shot, everything works. So you have this, I have this idea that like 30 cal mag is the best. It drops animals. I can make poor shots. It'll make up for poor shots. Somewhat true, somewhat, um, using maximized bullets, right? Not if you're using, not gut shooting a deer broadside with a, with a mono and thinking that's getting you anything. But if you blow the deer almost in half with an expanding fragmenting bullet, yeah, it might get you something. You might pop that diaphragm, right? So then I had some people that couldn't handle the recoil. So then we had to go, we, we started 308. Well, we shot a lot of deer with 308, so that's fine. 243. And then the first two deer were poor, like had to shoot them multiple times. I didn't know crap. This is early, early to mid 2000s, like right in the beginning. I look it up and everybody's telling me, shoot a 95 grain nozzle ballistic tip. That's the bullet for a 243. Fine. Went to Walmart, bought a box. The next 40 deer, zero feet traveled. Right? So then we shot, we were shooting so many deer, we could shoot and track 100 deer per bullet per cartridge in a single season. So when it was over for that 12 months, the 100 deer shot with 300 wind mags and 300 PRC, not PRC, didn't exist, 300 rum, 178s, AMAXs, which is the at the time the most destructive tissue bullet in a 30 cal. We had one more deer that ran, as in not a bang flop immediate, with the 300 than we did the 243. In other words, I think it was something like 96 out of the 100 from muzzle to like 400 yards with the 243 did bang flop, like boom, and the deer just dropped. And it was like 94, 95 with the 300 wind mag dropped. So we had one more runner with this massive gun compared to the little gun. That was the first like, uh-oh, bullets matter, right? And then we kept going. And then when the 223 hit, we talk about this. Like it is across broad spectrum of everybody that comes hunting with us. We, we, I see a lot of animals shot. We shoot a lot of animals. I expect one out of 10 to three out of 10. So 10 to 30% shot with magnums is going to be a rodeo. A wound, a miss, something goes wrong. We were over 200 with a 223 with zero rodeos. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's not the people who are experts. I'm talking from brand new to base level training 
and we were not passing shots. It wasn't like that animal's too far or the, an the angle's not right. It's simply, okay, you have wound cavity and then you have shootability. And there's a crossover point, right? There's also a crossover point where the 22 cal, you're so far away that your, your success rate that is recovering the, I want to kill the animal. And at the end of that event, you're looking at the animal on the ground. That would, would be me for total success, right? Yeah. It's going to be higher the bigger you go, and it, but it's not necessarily wound channel. I wouldn't, I would not make a habit of shooting elk at 800 yards with a 223 or deer period, any animal. But it's wind drift. It's wind drift and spotting the impact and the splash, not the wound channel. If you hit them, it's fine, right? But a thirty cal or six five is much easier to spot than it is a twenty two tiny bullet flying through the air. So the reason I quote unquote like small guns is only because in the amount of animals we shoot, from muzzle to way beyond what what almost anyone is say is acceptable. The least, excuse my language, the least amount of fuck-ups happen as recoil goes down. Recoil and muzzle blast. So, like, I like brakes. I was shooting muzzle brakes on ARs and M4s when people wanted to crucify me for doing so. Because I don't care about you. I want to see my own shot. Right? <laughs> but then when we started shooting animals suppressed... The reaction was so much better. The animals reacted less. So success rate went up, right? So because we can see enough animals get shot in enough different environments, like we can track large numbers, like the high zero to 450, 500 yards. Like if I don't know the shooter and you just lay guns out, man, the 223 with the 77 grain TMK has got the best kill rate. Like I don't care who it is. If they shoot, it's best. Right? And it's like, okay, well, Ryan shoots big guns. I shoot big guns. You like big guns. It's it's pretty incredible. Sub six, seven, eight hundred yards, the hit rate difference between a really well set up magnum from like alternate position. So not perfectly prone with a bipod, even with dudes who can shoot. And that same thing if it recoils like a 223. Like it is measurable. I mean, I I can tell you my hit rate specifically, um, it drops by about 10% per five pounds of recoil added to the gun, foot pounds of recoil, right? So if I'm at quote unquote, there's no such thing as 100%, but let's say I'm 90% hit rate with five foot pounds of 223. If I take the same position, same time, and I go to a 10 pound recoil, a 10 foot pound recoil, so like a six mil Creedmoor 243, it's dropping five to ten percent. Six five, another five to ten percent. Six five PRC, another five. I mean, and it's this isn't like I like, I think, I feel. This is measured. We could do it with everybody. I mean, you do our hunt the hunting rifle drill thing, and you know, everybody always talks about like, well, why don't you do it with magnums? Well, we do. When I shoot it with a 300 wind mag, we have yet to have a person do that hunting rifle drill with a magnum non-break gun, break 15 out of 20. No matter how much they shoot, I've never seen anybody do it. Like, it's horrible. And that same person will be in the 17, 18, 19 range with a 223 or 6 mil. So, like, yes, like, the big guns do more damage, but you also miss more with them. So, like, before this year, because I said we had more mess-ups this year than, like, the last 10 combined probably. Like, oh, my God, the dreaded gut shot. I don't think I don't think we've had a single animal shot in the guts with a 223 until this year. I might be mistaken, but I don't think so. We're talking about 300 big game animals. This year we had two. And it was new shooters very excited, right? They weren't fully trained up and but they the farthest one went 80 yards and laid down and then it was killed pretty cleanly. Right, like it wasn't a bullet thing, and that was with two twenty threes. However, like I said, it's like fifty percent with magnums. <laughs> right, so it's like, yeah, this one gun may do better if you gut shoot something. What I what I find, including with myself, is the moment I start worrying about that, the more often I gut shoot the animal. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and I think also having suppressors helps with that. Oh, that, yeah. Suppressors changes the game with right, animal Jay? reaction. So one of the things, and I think we talked about this, you notice with little guns, because I certainly did when I started shooting, is I noticed I was shooting animals more than once, including unsuppressed, right? When I started shooting with 223s, I'm like, why am I shooting every deer with two rounds? And it wasn't until I put this one deer that I shot and again, rapid bolt manipulation, shooting quick is a thing, right? We, I practice for it. And when I shot it, it was falling in the scope and just scraped its back from the animal falling. And then I went back and realized it's because I can shoot it faster. It wasn't the time to death was the same, whether I was shooting a 308 or seven mag or whatever. It was just, I could put more rounds on the same, instead of recoiling me, knock, knocking me off target and then having to come back on it, et cetera, I could just shoot more. And then when you get a suppressor, it just does it even more because the animal doesn't move. So it's like if we shoot uh, an elk with a 308 or 30 cal and we just shoot it one time in the chest and we wait for it to fall over, 30 seconds to three, four minutes. is If it doesn't move, if it doesn't run, right? And suppressors cause that. They don't, they don't run as much. Well, we could do the same thing with a two, six mil. It does the same thing. D there's no real difference in time. The difference is you just end up shooting them more with small guns. You can shoot them more. Makes sense to me. Well, we better sign off before Jake falls asleep. <laughs> Man, we we 245 minutes in right now. Hey, so, so uh, you got anything more to add to this? No, I think it was great information. Um, I'm going to have to listen to this podcast probably five or six fucking times to get all the information out of it. Uh -huh. But uh, if you have any questions, podcast at shoottohunt.com. Let's hear them good and bad. What did we lie about? If you have more questions that you want to have for him to answer, which he could probably answer, let us know. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you.